Hi, and welcome to Temple Street, the show brought to you by the Department of Communication and Journalism at Suffolk University. I'm Matthew Schleining. I'm David Pollard. And I'm Cassandra Ellis. In today's show, we will be taking a look at Suffolk's new logo, Skating on Frog Pond, Boston's third annual food festival, as well as Suffolk University's Soul Center helping the homeless. We will also, also ask people their ideal gift for the holidays, have a sit-down interview with Suffolk alum Pam Gaudiano and about her job at WGBH. Then we'll look at Suffolk University's men's hockey team in their up-and-coming season. We will end, as always, with Critics Corner, and today I'll be talking about the challenges of driving and parking in Boston. The Office of Marketing and Communications recently led a university-wide overhaul to Suffolk's branding system, including a new logo. Temple Street Nick Jones has the story. Suffolk just got a makeover. In a partnership with digital media firm Samet's Blackstone Associates, the university just unveiled its new look. Janice Lang, senior graphic designer at Suffolk's Office of Marketing and Communication, says the university was in need of a new brand identity. If you look at sort of um, the different pieces that were out there and the different logos, you know, the law school had something that was different from the rest of the university and from the other schools. This was a really good opportunity to bring everybody together under one roof. Samet's director of design, Jörg Dressler, was the lead on the project. It was important for us to come up with a um, symbol that is um, new and fresh, but at the same time will last for several years. Um, that is not trendy um, because there is no use in um, reinventing a logo in a few years so it needed to be classic but more importantly it needed to speak to the attributes. Kathleen Peets, Director of Creative Services, provides some insight into what's behind the new logo. The symbol itself has some significant meaning. There's the it's a shield and a flame that comes out of the shield and the, the flame is a direct reference to our seal and the torch which symbolizes knowledge and learning. Um, so that's a direct nod to that. And then the shield is kind of a universal symbol of academics. It's a strong, dynamic image that can be used across all of the different schools. And that was one big piece of what we were missing, was one symbol that could be representative of all the different schools. As Denise reiterates, the point of this project was to unify all of Suffolk University's various offices and divisions. When you looked at them, spread out on a table, all the different schools, the different offices, the different divisions, it looked very different. So in an effort to sort of rein everything in and feel like a cohesive um, body of material and a cohesive university, um, we needed to re really update the look of the print materials, including the, the logo as well. I think that our biggest challenge in this particular office has been learning how to work with it in formal situations. I sort of look at it as a challenge of I have these guidelines that I'm going to or these you know these rules I'm going to play with play within and how can I change things and how can I push myself as a designer to make something different or make something new or to you know think outside the box but stay within the bigger box at the same time. It helps the whole university look forward, look to the future and where we're going and, and who we are going to be in the next hundred years of being Suffolk University. With a new president and a new logo, it looks like Suffolk University is ready to hit the ground running in 2013. Nick Jones, Temple Street. Incorporating the new brand, Suffolk University launched its new website, which went live last week. Christmas time is in the air, and that means plenty of traditional events taking place around the city. Ice skating on the Frog Pond is one of the city's most beloved traditions, bringing people from all around to take out their skates and join in the fun. Temple Street's Shane Walsh and Kevin Genitasio joined in and filed this report. In the heart of the nation's oldest public park lies the historic Frog Pond. Boston Common comes to life each winter as students and residents from the Boston area 
and throughout the Commonwealth come to enjoy the winter weather. Whether a first-time skater or training Olympian, the rink serves as a destination for everyone during the holiday season. Enjoying being on vacation and having a place to skate even though it's not really uh, skating weather yet. It's obviously picturesque. I just like feel free on the ice. I feel like I'm in my element. I, in the winter, the trees, they're really beautiful and seeing all the uh, like lights up on the trees and then coming here to see all the like pretty girls. There are not many places that you can get this sense of history like you have at the Boston Common. The Parks Department has teamed with the Skating Club of Boston to expand programs to include ice skating scholarships and lessons for those who are handicapped or have special needs. Sherry Rigby, Director of Programs for the Frog Pond and the Skating Club of Boston, has worked to expand community outreach to give back to the city. Um, we do a lot of outreach. We have a program called Skating in the Schools, where we've developed a curriculum uh, science. It's called the Art and Science of Skating. One day a week we work in the classroom and talk about science, and then we bring them here to the ice for free skating lessons. Admission to the rink is free for kids under 13 and $5 for adults. Use your student ID on college nights every Tuesday to skate for $2. As winter settles in, sharpen your skates and enjoy an afternoon out on the ice. Getting out of the office, getting out of your apartment, your condo, or off your campus and out here where you can breathe the fresh air and look at the trees is huge. It's great for everyone. For Temple Street, Kevin Genitasio and Shane Walsh. Yeah, Frog Pond is a great place to go, and I love the environment and going there for the winter to go skating. I agree. I used to go all the time when I was a little girl. <laughs> this year's third annual Boston Local Food Festival held in its new location at Rose Kennedy Greenway focused not only on culinary delights, but also environmental considerations. Temple Street reporter Ray Hing Ha has the story. In an attempt to increase the demand for local food, this year's Outdoor Food Festival provided an opportunity for as many as 120 vendors and over 40,000 festival goers to connect with each other. People enjoyed countless options of specialty foods from different traders, local restaurants, and food trucks, and also freshly harvested produce from local farms. A vendor from the Heaven Harvest Farm says educating people about the possibility of getting farm-to-table food is key. We specialize in organic produce straight to the communities, the urban communities, to help make people make healthy choices. According to the data from Sustainable Business Network, currently less than 5% of food eaten in Massachusetts is from local sources. The festival organizers say they want to raise this number through promotion and education. Yeah, hi, we're um, the Sustainable uh, Business Network is here to encourage local businesses to um, educate the um, consumer in Boston so that they're more familiar with sustainable businesses and so they can enjoy some great food and have a nice day um, supporting the local sustainable businesses. Besides its core interest in local food businesses, the festival this year was also committed to be a zero-waste event, where most of the waste was recycled, reduced, or reused. To achieve this goal, organizers required vendors to use recyclable materials as much as possible and to bring minimal paper and plastic waste. Yes, our goal for a zero waste event is to have at least 90% of the um, waste from the event be compostable and recyclable. So 10% or less would be trash. And we're, and we're definitely accomplishing that. Apart from tasting local food on a perfect four day, people also communicated with food producers, learned cooking skills from entertaining demonstrations, and more importantly, fast food organizers say people help to take care of the environment. For Tempo Street and Rain Ho. It seems like a great opportunity to learn, eat, and enjoy the great fall weather. I'll be sure to check it out next year. Suffolk University's Souls Community Service and Service Learning Center are making a conscious effort to help the city's homeless this winter. They hosted several events in November in honor of Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. Alex Wyckoff and Bridget Wood have more on the story. Suffolk University's Soul Center for Community Engagement has one mission, to raise awareness and help those who are less fortunate. Founded in 1997, Souls hosts different events every November to help those that are homeless. 
These events range from volunteer opportunities to different guest speakers. Caroline McKethy, Community Partnership Scholar, says that the events are meant to teach the Suffolk community about the challenges of hunger and homelessness. Among the many efforts is Caroline's own project, the Make Change Exhibit. We wanted to give people uh, an opportunity to hear the voice of somebody who's experienced homelessness. So three of these interviews are from people that are vendors at Spare Change News and two of them are people who now work at Boston Rescue Mission but are former clients. So I actually interviewed all five of them and asked about how they became homeless, what challenges they had to face every day, how they eventually transitioned out of homelessness, just so that people could hear the voice of somebody who's faced homelessness as, you know, personally. I was ashamed of being homeless. It just, it was never even a part of my, my vocabulary. I, and I didn't think about homeless people before I became homeless. But that to me, like having to carry everything, all my belongings on my back all day long, and just thinking that people knew, they were pointing at me, that guy's homeless. In addition to raising awareness, the Souls Office has also set up different donation boxes around campus where students can give warm clothes and food to those less fortunate. And we also raise money to buy socks for an organization called Oasis and then we hand out those socks to people that have to spend uh, the winter on the streets. McKeffey says that this is an issue that students need to be more aware of. But I think it's important to Suffolk University because we are a school in downtown Boston and we encounter the issue of homelessness probably multiple times a day. And not many people know what to do about it. Not many people know the different complexities behind homelessness. And all of these different events are working to not only attempt to stop the issue of homelessness from happening anymore, but also to just raise awareness about how complex the entire issue is. Alex Wyckoff and Bridget Wood reporting for Temple Street. To find out more about what you can do to help this winter, go to www.oasiscoalition.org. With Black Friday marking the beginning of craziness of holiday shopping, Jeanette Glass hit downtown to find out what Bostonians think makes the ultimate gift. What do you think are going to be some of the hot Christmas gifts to get this year? Oh, uh, anything on the TV, uh, whatchamacallit, those, those space boxes the kids use. I'm 50, I used to call it Atari or TV games. Oh, and Yep, everybody's going crazy over um, video games, so I'd have to say that new Black Ops, and Call of Duty, and maybe NBA 2K13. When I was like nine years old, I'll never forget this, I wanted a uh, Nintendo 64 Wicked Bad, and I got that along with Super Mario Brothers, and I was pumped, and then uh, a week later it got stolen. Oh. But, you know, for the time being when I had it, it was awesome. My mom, when I was like 18, she bought me a really nice camcorder. It was HD, like it had like night screen vision on it. I loved it. Like I used to take a whole bunch of pictures um, in night vision. My brother and I came downstairs one morning and we had this like matching Gary Fisher BMX bikes. That was easily my, you know, <laughs> most exciting because it's just huge. As a little kid, uh, a bike that had a uh what they would call now, or I guess a few years ago, pimped out with the, <laughs> you know, with the, the handlebars, the long wheel, the, the side view mirror. My first Christmas in America, it was the best and memorable because it was the first time I actually got a Barbie. You know, I'm a music enthusiast, so definitely, you know, album, music album, you know, Bob Marley album. But this year, I'm not trying to get my son a laptop because he's been asking me for the laptop all the time. Um, laptop plus a game too. I'd like a new iPhone, I guess. <laughs> Those are some awesome holiday memories. Yeah, it reminds me of when I was younger and the UPS man showed up on Christmas morning. It was pretty special to me. <laughs> that seems like a Christmas for the books. Stay tuned while we take a quick break. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We're gonna beat them and bust them. The them. smallest them. moments can have the biggest beat impact on a child's them. life. Let's get a little bit rowdy, R-O-W-D-Y. Take time to be a dad One more today. Time. All those boys are much too much. Those boys. Okay, this time, 
I'm gonna do it. I'm going to actually go to school. Tell me about some of the stuff you've had to deal with. I just dropped out completely. I just got caught up in it, the whole scene with the alcohol and the drugs. I was arrested. A lot of my friends, they were really concerned, especially my friend Aaron. You just have to find someone. They don't have to tell you advice. They don't have to do that. They just listen. Give your friends the boost they need to graduate. Join us at BoostUp.org. Boston athletes have joined forces with the Sports Museum to help stop bullying in Boston. Bullying is not a game. It's a serious problem. If you are being bullied, you are not alone. If you're being a bully, you can't play on my team. If you're being a bully, stop. 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 Right now. Stand strong against bullying. Together, we can stop bullying in Boston. To join our team, visit bostonversusbullies.org. Boston versus bullies. Boston versus bullies. Boston versus bullies. Whose team were you on? Welcome back to Temple Street. Here's something that will be of interest to all you students out there who are getting closer to graduating and wondering where their degree can take them. Temple Street reporter Scott Carroll sat down with Suffolk graduate Pam Gaudiano, an associate producer of the American Experience at WGBH, to learn about her path to a dream job. Thanks, guys. I'm here today with Pam Gaudiano, who is the associate producer of American Experience for PBS at WGBH and also a Suffolk alum. Hi, Pam. Welcome. It's great to be here. Oh, glad to have you here. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm a big fan of the show American Experience. Good to hear. It's, uh, I've been watching it for a while, and uh, when I researched it a little bit, I was amazed to find out that there's almost oh, well over 200 shows. Yes. Yeah. We have, we've been around, we were going to be in our 25th season. Um, it started at WGBH years ago. Um, just an idea to bring um, American history to public television. And it's blossomed into um, a great big series that uh, is recognized, and we're the longest-running history series on television right now. Didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is your job there? Uh, my title right now is associate producer. I've been with the series for uh, just over 10 years now. Started as a production assistant, worked sort of my way through. Um, so right now, as an associate producer, I work closely with um, the, a producer on a program that we're doing about former Amish members. Um, we're doing a two-hour documentary. Last season, we did a documentary just on the Amish um, and sort of, you know, background, historical look at the Amish and, and how they live. And one of the, the main things is was when we start a show and you need to interview a lot of people, um, it's just coordinating the shooting and I do everything and this is something that every production assistant will do or associate everyone from the associate producers you're constantly doing travel plans because um, you're traveling and you're shooting in places so it's dealing with so many a lot of details um, it's also getting to know the subject really well with the producer hmm. um, the producer will work closely also with the editor as we're trying to put these stories together and you try to work and also get to know the subject really well because there's additional research that needs to go on in a subject. Yeah, I think the thing I really like about the show is it comes to life, sort of, I'd say, because, I, I, for instance, uh, the Freedom Riders, yeah. uh, when I saw that, I really felt what was going on. Instead of just reading it and having facts like I did in school, uh, there were live photos, uh, they showed the the old buses rolling, they showed yeah. uh, the bus that was caught fire because they were yeah. attacked and uh, they, they show people, actual footage of people getting beaten. Yeah. It really brings history alive and it made me more interested than I ever was reading it out of a book or hearing it from a professor. It's exactly what you said, we're you know, making uh, history come alive and that's exactly what we're trying to do. You know, you're trying to put a face on the things that you may see in books. You're, you're like meeting that person who went through that. So you watch some of these shows and you do get emotional because we are bringing it um, in a context that you can see and feel like, oh my God, this is what really what we went through. And some shows even can go back 100 years and you can still get that emotional about something. Well, I could go on and on about the show, obviously, but uh, there are time restraints. Okay. So <laughs> I want to get to how did you get to where you are right now. You, I, okay. I know you graduated Suffolk. Yes, I did. Did yep. you come here saying, I want to work with documentaries or I want to work at PBS, or did, did you have a, something else in mind and kind of 
changed or developed? Or? I was a student who um, was open to anything but was studying communications. So loved movies, probably wanted to work in either film or TV somehow, but you know, didn't have a focus. I, I was a communication major, um, so I went through what basically what everybody else is studying and it was sort of like figuring it out after. Um, but I did, I remember doing an internship. Um, I'm also a huge sports fan, so it was kind of tough because <laughs> I wasn't sure do I want to just work in sports? Do I want to work in films? And how does that work? And so it's, it's kind of tough too, even when you're coming out of school because you go through this. And unless you really find that passion yet, it may take a little bit after school, after you graduate. Um, I did an internship locally at the Channel 7 Sports Department. It did show me that as much as I love sports, I didn't want to just do that. I wanted to be part of it somehow, but I didn't want to just do that. What I liked about GBH is that a lot of stuff had started that you see on um, that you see on television all started at WGBH. A lot of the big PBS shows started at, you know, the first cooking show, oh. Julia Child started at WGBH, and now there's a whole channel for cooking shows. The first how-to show to fix your house at this old house started out of WGBH. That's one of those things where, you know, I kept applying, and it was really tough, and I decided there was this very short temporary um, very short temporary not long-term entry-level position and I knew I'm gonna try to go for it because not a lot of people are gonna go for that because it's it was only for a couple months um, and I was actually working at New England Cable News I mm -hmm. had been working there every year um, but I knew even though I love you know working at Ca New England Cable News was great it's not really what I want to do so I left there even though I knew I took this temporary job at GBH, it didn't mean I, I was going to be lucky enough to stay there. Yeah. But I got in, I got the this lo like low entry job, um, but it worked out because of all my other background of working at like New England Cable News and before that, that and I freelanced, so I always kind of kept within, um, within the work. And then from there, once I got in GBH and met people, then I could then I could prove and show, oh, uh, um, I, that A, I'm really excited to be here. I really want to be doing this and willing to learn and willing to do what it takes. Um, and that's kind of how it went from there. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> I, I appreciate you know, all the information. It was a wealth of information. And uh, thank you for coming on the show. All right. Well, thank you so much for asking me. This was great. Oh, good for me, too. Uh, okay. Back to you guys. Thank you, Scott and Pam. That sure was interesting. Um, I've been on the hunt for an internship lately, and hopefully that will lead to a good opportunity after I graduate. Yeah, I've been doing the same thing. According to Pam, there's no bad choice. She tried out a lot of things, and she seems to be pretty happy where she is. Yeah, she sure does. <laughs> Boston is a hockey town, and with the Bruins out of action, the local fans had to settle for the Frog Pond to get their ice fix. But we have some good news. The Suffolk men's hockey team is back in action. This season, the Rams play their home games at Sarity Rink in the North End, right down the street from TD Garden. Temple Street reporter Annie Morris has the story. With hockey season coming directly at us, the Suffolk men's team are flying around on sharpened skates under the tutelage of head coach Chris Glyona. Glyona isn't daunted by the challenge of having 15 freshmen on his roster this season. I think anytime you've got new blood, um, as a coach, you enjoy it because you get an opportunity to teach more. Um, we've, every day we're teaching, making these kids better, and uh, I like the challenge. Leading the charge on the ice is number two, Dan Fayok. The senior defenseman has exercised his role as a captain to bring the team together. We kind of grab them early in the season, kind of explain to them what we're about here, explain to them that we're a family. Luckily, we have a good group of freshmen. Uh, they're all starting to get the systems. They're all playing for us. And we're lucky, uh, Steve Drago and I, the other senior, they really bought in and they're really trying to help us have a good senior year. Anchoring the Suffolk defense is number 31, Brett Roman. The sophomore goalie out of Rock Tavern, New York, has improved since his freshman year struggles. 
The one thing we knew about Brett was nobody outworks him. And he worked very hard all year. He got better. By the end of the year, he was playing well, and we knew he'd work all summer, and uh, he's shown it on the ice so far. When the Rams take their home ice, they'll be playing at Sturdy Rink in the North End. And since they're the only hockey in downtown Boston, senior Stephen Drago thinks that's enough reason to get out and support uh, you know, the Rams. The fans, but you know, the students will want to see some hockey to come watch us play. And uh, this year with having a pretty good team, you know, it, it's, it's fun. People are willing to come down to the North End, five-minute walk, to watch some hockey instead of, uh, instead of staying at home and not being able to watch anything at all. For Temple Street, I'm Andy Morse. Be sure to catch the excitement when the Rams host the University of New England on January 5th at 425 in Starity Rink. If you've ever felt frustrated trying to drive or park in Boston, well, you're not alone. For more on our vehicular vexation, we turn to our Critics Corner with David Pollard. Thanks, Matt. Famous for its important role in American history and the beautiful city skyline, Boston is also widely known for its aggressive drivers. While normally polite in their daily interactions, when Bostonians get behind the wheel, they can get angry. Which begs the question, what about the Boston driving experience is so maddening that people are reduced to violent hand gestures and the abuse of expletives? And how can we fix it? Well, after considerable investigation of the matter, I found there are two major reasons and one possible solution. Reason one, traffic. If you've ever been on Route 93 entering Boston during rush hour, you know that getting to work on time is a futile effort. I don't know why they call it rush hour, really. It doesn't look like anyone on 93 is moving, let alone rushing. But what's more frustrating than being in a rush and sitting in traffic is the ultimate test of your patience, the hunt for a parking space. Finding a parking spot in Boston is like finding water in a desert. The problem is many people travel to Boston for work, only to find zero visitor parking options. This forces drivers to do one of three things. Park illegally, pay ransom to the attendants of a nearby garage, or look for a spot until they find one or their head explodes, whichever comes first. Perhaps the city needs a plan to help Bostonians deal with our transportation woes. The Big Dig was supposed to be the cure. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers has reported that the top three issues related to infrastructure in Massachusetts are roads, bridges, and mass transit. In other words, either way, we're in some trouble. Driving around Boston is tough enough without every other road being shut down for repairs. So what's in it for the city, you ask? Well, more money, of course. When you have to park at a meter, all the quarters go to the city. Or if you're greeted with the familiar fluorescent orange flag underneath the windshield wiper, that's money for the city. If your boiling rage from getting parking tickets causes you to take your fury out on the road, you get pulled over, a cop meets his quota, and it's more money for the city. Fed up driving, taking the tea, guess what? That's money for the city as well. That said, the tea is the only immediate solution I can see, short of walking. It may not assuage your stress levels, but the tea is the cheapest way to leave life on the road behind you. I wish I could say that driving conditions will improve, but after pouring over $15 billion into the big dig with little effect on mobility, it's safe to say our woes will continue no matter how much money the city collects from us. But if you still choose to drive, know what you're getting into. If you find yourself getting upset at other drivers, don't give them the bird. Give them a break. Let's all come together and stop driving each other crazy. Everyone gets upset behind the wheel, but it does seem a lot more frequent when you're closer to the city. Oh, that's because there's mo more Bostonians closer to Boston. Well, that's all we have for today. I'm Matthew Sliney. I'm David Pollard. And I'm Cassandra Ellis. We'll see you next time on Temple Street. Mm -hmm.